Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and welcome ladies and gentlemen. You're tuned in live to today's broadcast of the Kev Baker Show right here on the number one network, Truth Frequency Radio, www.tfrlive.com. It's finally here, May the 8th, the date and the show that I just haven't been able to shut up about. I have been so super excited I bet a lot of you listeners out there will be glad when today's over and done with because I've just been, like I say, so excited about today's show. And the reason for that is, over the time here doing the Kev Baker show, the conversation and the subjects have tended to lean more towards science and technology, especially more and more as we move into the future. And the technology that is all around us certainly is having an impact on all of our lives Some of it we see, some of it we don't. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. It's a double-edged sword, the same as anything else. But it's here, it's real. And tonight we're going to be talking about that. And it was a few years ago that I came into contact with Anthony Patch because I've always tried to get the best guests at the time to come on and talk about various topics. And myself and Anthony, we talked extensively about CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, and the search for the God Particle. But during my time working with Anthony, I also had my eyes opened to another new emerging technology at the time. And Anthony introduced me to a company called D-Wave Systems, and they were based over in Canada. And what D-Wave Systems were doing was they were trying to produce, and had produced, the world's first and most powerful quantum computer. Well, I watched a presentation that came from, I believe, Idea City back in 2013 by one of the main men behind that company. Now, talk about a presentation that literally changed my life. It certainly changed the direction of the show here. And in the years that have followed, it has led to so many hours of discussion and speculation in the meantime. I was listening to this guy talking about this quantum computer And how these qubits, these things that weren't ones or zeros, they were ones and zeros, and they were both in this dimension and the next. He was talking about altars to alien gods, reaching into parallel dimensions and bringing back resources. So that obviously whet my appetite. And not in a stalkerish kind of way, but more in admiration, I continued to follow this man's work over the years moved on to something called Quadrant, then Kindred AI, and eventually, and now, he is at a company called Sanctuary AI. So having shifted his focus away from the quantum computing, more towards robotics and building machines like us, we literally have somebody here that is trying to bring the TV show Westworld to life. And if you hadn't guessed it already, folks, that's right, today... I'm joined by that very man. That man in question is Jordy Rose. And Jordy comes to us all the way from Canada. I think he's in Canada today. And he studied engineering at McMaster University before going on to obtain a PhD in my favourite subject, theoretical physics. I'm still pinching myself because he's here today. And no, folks, it's not his side-loaded synth that's here. I can tell you. Are you sure about that? I'm not too (laughs) sure yet. There he is, the man himself, Jordy Rose. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Hi, Kev. It's great to um, finally have you on here. And I feel like the least I can do is offer you some airtime and a platform to speak to us. Because over the years, you've provided me with so many hours of content. Some of, it, some of it close to the mark, some of it way, way off the mark. But like I said in the introduction there, one thing I've tried to do for myself and the audience is always go to the very best people, the, the ones that are involved in the story. And you, sir, like I said to you off air before we came on, you've literally invented something here that has changed the world. And 100 years from now, you know, not very many people will be able to say this, but I'm literally, I think, speaking to somebody whose name will still be known 100 years from now. So straight off the bat, I want to thank you for coming on today, sharing some of your time with us, and for giving me hours of content. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm t- 
tickled that uh, I've been able to provide the <laughs> that content. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm all yours for at least an hour. <laughs> awesome stuff, man. And I want to kind of wind back the clock because I think we should go back to that presentation. You know, the one with the altar to the alien yep. god, because I think that was the world's really the first taste of you and the quantum computer. And some of the things that you said in that presentation, whether purposefully or, or not. It really led to a lot of the hype, a lot of the sensational stuff that came out in the aftermath of that. So first up, before we even get to that, I mean, what led you into the world of quantum computing? You know, what, what was it made you decide to go there? Uh, well, uh, so as you mentioned, I started as an engineer back when I was in, in undergrad. And uh, after I graduated, I didn't know what to do. And uh, I... I actually applied to several different kinds of disciplines, uh, everything from aerospace engineering to theoretical physics and everything in the middle, uh, pure math and a bunch of other things, because I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. Um, and the reason I ended up being theoretical physics is the only place I got in was UBC in theoretical physics. I got rejected by everyone else. <laughs> so I, uh, um, I ended up going to, to uh, the theoretical physics program at UBC. And almost uh, uh, by accident, the, the, the leading people in that the department were all studying uh, what's called condensed matter theory, which is the study of materials at... at it's basically material science, solid state physics. And uh, the particular thing that they were looking at that I thought was really cool was um, why is it that the quantum mechanics is, as a description of language works so well under certain circumstances, but it works so poorly under others? So if, uh, if you look very closely at an individual electron's behavior, it obeys a certain set of laws, quantum mechanics. And uh, but if you look at a ball that you, you know baseball, you're throwing a baseball. You don't need to know any quantum mechanics to know what the ball is and what it does. What, uh, and so the question is, why is an electron different than a baseball? And it turns out that that is a devilishly difficult question to answer. Um, so what uh, I ended up becoming uh, interested in, almost by accident, was uh, what it, what is it about? The, about nature, the world around us, that starts off with this underlying language of quantum mechanics, and then eventually what what makes sense to us as people emerges from that somehow. How does that work? So uh, at the beginning, this study was all about equations and specifically things that were very numerical about the equations of quantum mechanics, and in particular what happens when the equations of quantum mechanics, the temperature of the system rises. In, in one of the well-known effects in quantum mechanics is that uh, as the temperature of a system rises, quantum mechanics matters less and less. So I studied that particular thing in my uh, PhD work. So the question about how that relates to quantum computers. So when I was about to graduate in the late 90s, uh, quantum computing started becoming a term that was used in the theoretical math and computer communities to, um, uh, to start to think about what it would mean if we could build a computer that obeyed a completely different set of rules. Our, our, all of the computers that we use today, except for the D-Wave ones and maybe a few others that are being built around the world, they all operate using the same, you can think of as bedrock instructions, the, the laws of physics. You can't violate them. So for example, if I, if I build a computer, I can't say in my program, go back in time five minutes and execute this instruction. You can't do that because that's not allowed by physics. And the, the, the central difference between quantum computers and classical computers is that the quantum computers, at back then being mostly a theoretical thing, uh, were potentially capable of doing things that conventional computers couldn't because they used different physics. So while quantum mechanics doesn't, at least as far as I know, allow you to go backwards in time, it does give you access to other things that are not allowed classically. So if I wanted to write a computer program that said, please do this weird quantum thing, I could do that now, whereas I couldn't with a conventional computer. So uh, I read a book in the late 90s, which was written by a, by a guy called uh, Colin, Will Colin Williams, 
which was called Introduction to Quantum Computing. It was the sort of thing that you find in a university bookstore. And that really hooked me. I thought, okay, this is a really neat thing. It's related to what I was doing. So why don't I try to build one of these things? You know, when you're young uh, and you've been kind of successful along the way, you think, well, nothing is going to stand in my way. I'm just going to bolt those all the problems. I'm going to solve this thing. And uh, so along with a few other friends that I'd made along the way, we founded D-Wave with the mission of being the first company in the world to build a quantum computer, a computer that uses the resources of the quantum world in order to uh, be better at what it does than anything that you could otherwise build. Well, I have to ask, Jordy, when, when you were sitting down and you were thinking about building this thing, you know, did you look at nature itself? and look for the closest thing that nature has to a quantum computer, i.e. Yeah. our brain, and literally try to recreate that? No, so let's back up a step. So the, uh, the couple of things about this. The answer to your first question is yes, and it's actually a very deep thing. And a lot of um, the differences in the way that D-Wave as an organization works and the other quantum computing groups traces back to this very question. So. D-Wave was formed of people who are scientists who studied material science. And those people are very grounded in experiment. They're the types of people who actually like put little slabs of stuff under microscopes and look at them. Uh, the quantum computing community back then, and even now to a certain extent, is not those people. It's formed of people who are theoretical people, who do pencil and paper work, and very rarely actually think about the real world. And there's nothing wrong with that. but it's, it indicates a very different way of thinking about um, what to do with your time. If you're a theoric, theoretical person, what to do with your time is mostly spent asking questions like, what is the ultimate computing power of the universe? So it's a very interesting question. It's something that you can think about. But people like me, who are more grounded in the real world, for me, the question is, can you use all of these things to actually build things that work? And so the question about whether we looked at nature, the answer is yes. The kinds of quantum computers that D-Wave builds are built to mimic materials that are called quantum magnets. So they're, a little, they're, they're basically like a little array of magnets. Uh, they exist already in materials. The problem is you can't program them. So all of these little magnets don't come with little wires that say, you know, set this to five or whatever. They're just a thing that nature does. But they do all of the kinds of things that you need to build a quantum computer. So we use that as inspiration. Now, the second question about the brain. I uh, am in uh, the very lucky position of having spent half my life in quantum mechanics building quantum things and half my life in AI and robotics building robots that are increasingly trying to be intelligent, like, like say, like a dog. Uh, we don't know how to do intelligence like humans yet, but we do, I think, know enough to be able to start thinking about building machines that have certain capabilities that are very much like animals, and that's the way I think about the problem. But the two fields don't overlap, in my view. The I don't think the brain uses any quantum mechanics at all in anything it does. Now, of course it does, because it's made out of stuff, and all stuff will base quantum mechanics at some point. But what I mean is that the, 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 the things that it does that we're trying to copy don't use quantum mechanics. It's all classical. It's all things like um, that you can simulate using neural nets and databases. And well, there's all a problem sort of with the brain right away anyway, isn't there? Because it's warm and wet versus what we see inside the, the altar to the alien god, right? It's not very conducive to quantum effects in the brain. No, it's not. But I, by the way, I don't think that's a good enough argument. Because, uh, like I was, uh, the quantum mechanics is a slippery thing. There is a, a, a popular conception that quantum effects don't survive certain kinds of things like being warm and wet. That's not true. You can have uh, inherently quantum mechanical effects at high temperatures. You can have them in large things. You can have them in contact with water. It's just that the, the kinds of quantum effects that you try to use when you build a computer that's not the same kind of quantum thing that's going on in the brain. So the, in, in the, the quantum computing sense of quantum, you need not only the quantum, but you need to be able to, to very precisely and elegantly um, program it and then use those 
characteristics in a, in a way that is very guided, let's say, uh, engineered. So uh, in the brain, there's no evidence that such uh, quantities exist. Now, I know that there are people who claim that there might be some mechanisms, but for me, it's grasping at straws. It's kind of like saying, well, we don't understand how the brain works, and we really kind of don't understand how what quantum mechanics is all about. So See, let's just like cancel them out. The, it doesn't work that way. The, the reason uh, I went it back... is both both of those things are true. We don't understand what quantum mechanics means, or even if there's some theory that supersedes it that might be very unlike it, which I think is actually quite likely. Or uh, and we also don't really understand how the brain works, and we won't until we've built one. There's only one way to claim that you really fundamentally understand human minds, and that's to build them. You know, this, this old maxim, I very strongly believe it, is that you don't understand something until you can build it. That's true. It's not good enough to scribble a bunch of stuff on a piece of uh, pe you know, pencil paper or write a scientific paper. You need to build the thing if you're going to really understand it. And so part of my, the journey that I've taken through the technological landscape has been moving into much more complex, difficult areas. Quantum computing, although know, it's very sexy and kind of uh, has a cachet of being difficult, is nowhere near as complicated as trying to understand how uh, the minds of biological organisms work. The See, minds of biological organisms are so much more difficult to understand than quantum computers that they're, they're not even on the same scale. And uh, it's very important to kind of grasp that notion, uh, how, how difficult it is to try to build true AI. Yeah, the only reason I went down that kind of might seem strange line of questioning is because when we were looking into this and the D-Wave and everything else, we came across a, a presentation, I think it was by Stuart Hameroff, and it right. was into quantum biology. Uh, and sitting in amongst the crowd was Eric Ladozinski, and of course Eric mm -hmm. D-Wave as well. And that's the reason I ask you that there, because we had this theory that, that the ideal D-Wave would be something that contained 65,536 qubits, okay? And the reason we got to that number was because that was the number of tubulin dimers, these things that Hameroff was saying had these quantum effects. So that's why, and that's how we got to some of the claims and made some of the hypothesis that we made about your machine in the first place. Well, I, 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 uh, I think that it's difficult to try to equate. So the, the, the way that we build computers, there's the hardware part, which is the actual stuff, like the number of qubits and all that. And then there's how you use it, which we typically think of as software. Now, in, in, in systems like the brain, the two are kind of so intertwined, it's hard to disconnect them. But it's, it's, uh, while it's, it's seductive to think of brains as being measured in terms of speed or hardware capability, I think that's wrong. And lots of people do this. Um, Ray Kurzweil constantly does this when he plots you know, the number of floating point operations per $1,000 versus the number of like operations per second a human brain does and set claims that when they you know when they intersect we're going to have computers like the brain that's 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 wrong because the 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 hard part about understanding a brain has little to do with how fast it processes and everything to do about how it works uh, the 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 how it works part is the hard part it's not the speed of the hardware and all that because we don't know how it works. You know, it's got all of these different things going on at the same time. And a lot of the conceptions that we have about how brains work are probably wrong to begin with. So not only is it really complicated, but when we think about studying it, we often start from something that I would consider to be the completely wrong perspective. Uh, like, for example, comparing the brain directly to the speed of a computer or the number of qubits that you've got is not enough because the speed of the computer is, re is useless if you're not running the right kinds of algorithms on it, you know, the, the thing that would be trying to replicate what the brain actually does. And we don't know what that is. So the, uh, uh, that, that's a, uh, by the way, the, the whole Stuart Hamroff thing, there is something very interesting about the way the brain works that is absolutely clear to everybody. And that's that anesthetics work. And nobody knows exactly why. So when you're subject to a general anesthetic, the science of this is not well understood. Why is it that you lose your consciousness when you're subjected to these molecules? And I know I'm not an expert in this, but I think that the reason is that there's some specific receptor in your brain that these things clog up. So there you have an example where a molecule, which is like a quantum mechanical thing, 
is uh, jamming itself into some machinery, which is also quantum mechanical, and clearly interfering with your consciousness. So uh, some people who are very smart, um, that I know personally, good friends of mine, are believe that there is an intimate connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness. And I don't want to say clearly that's not true, because of we really don't know. You know, until you know the details of something, it's very arrogant to claim that you're, yo, well, quantum mechanics can't be blah, blah, blah. You know, all I can say is that my intuition is, is that most of the things that make us who we are, we can replicate in conventional hardware, I think. But until we actually do it or find a reason why we can't, it's just an opinion. And really, my opinion isn't more important than anyone else's. Um, maybe the big difference between me and most people is when I have an opinion, I try to build the thing and I don't always succeed, but it is kind of my style is that I want, if I have a, a view about something like, I think I can build this quantum computing thing, or I think I can build an AI that's just like a person. The next step for me is, okay, well, how do we do it? Let's do it. <laughs> see, that, that, see, that's what I like about you. You know, instead of just sitting there theorizing at the blackboard, like you rightly say, you're, you're literally building things that are practical. You're building things that don't exist. You're not just talking about it. You're doing it. Now, before we go to the break, quickly on the D-Wave again, other dimensions, parallel worlds. Is the D-Wave literally right. opening portals to these untold numbers of other dimensions? So this is, this is, a, this is a really meaty question. Yeah. And um, the... Um, back to this business about quantum mechanics and what it means. So there are different what are called interpretations of quantum mechanics. And uh, so quantum mechanics is a thing to compute numbers. All of these interpretations kind of say the same things and maybe they identically they say the same things. But the different interpretations have very different uh, views of what is actually there. You know, the actual reality of reality. And the one that I've always preferred, maybe because it has more of a uh, poetic feel to it, and I know maybe that's not a good reason as a, as a scientist, but I think as a, uh, as a human, it means a lot. You know, we're always trying to figure out how to say things that are complicated, or at least in my world we are, uh, in ways that are both true, but not so devoid of any kind of feeling or soul that you're like, why would anybody even... Think about that twice. So there, there are ways of thinking about quantum mechanics that are technically correct and compatible with how you actually use it in practice that view um, decisions, and not just like conscious decisions, but anytime something happens as creating um, co different copies of reality. So this is sometimes called the, the many worlds hypothesis, that at, at every decision point where a thing has to be one thing or another, both are real in, in some sense and that there's no difference between them. But we just happen to be on one of these so-called branches of this, this um, multi-world thing. So in that, in that uh, picture, quantum computing does something very interesting. What it does is it, is it takes the branch that you're on where everything is just so. And it makes it so that um, the branches that are very close to it, in which everything is identical, like all the variables in all the universe is exactly the same as the one that you're experiencing now, the only difference being the state of the chip. So if you imagine two parallel universes, call them, where everything is the same except the value of a qubit. So in one of them it's zero, in one of them it's one. And then I send a signal down into this chip that says, you know, flip the bit or whatever. A way, maybe a poetic way, but it's consistent with the way the thing works, is that that signal is acting not just in one copy of the multiverse, but two. And the, the interesting thing is that in quantum mechanics, as I increase the number of qubits, the number of these different branches of the wave function that grows exponentially. So if I have two qubits, I have four possibilities, like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. If I have three qubits, now I've got eight. If I've got four, I've got 16. So this doubling doesn't take you very long before you get to some astronomical number. So one of the ways that I've always thought about this, uh, as somebody who's, who's a scientist who's graduated into being more of a person who's in the real world, 
is that the um, this picture of the multiverse is very evocative. You know, it, it captures the imagination. It makes this thing feel magical. That there may actually be a bunch of these different things out there somewhere with the same reality as ours. Hold that thought. We'll be back after the break. Don't go anywhere. Jordy Rose on the Kev Baker Show. Welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, synths. Who knows what's listening out there tonight? But Jordy Rose is my special guest today. And he, of course, is the man that helped to found D-Wave Systems, give us the world's first quantum computer. I think they're up to over 5,000 qubits in their most recent model. But over the years since then, Jordy's moved on to where he is more recently right now at Sanctuary AI. And we're going to get into that as the conversation continues. Again, thank Jordy for his time, for joining us today, to fill in some of these gaps in the information. You know, when I talk about AI on the show, I always talk about how it tries to fill in the gaps in the information. And because of some of the gaps that have been left to our imagination, because of some of the things that Jordy has said in the past, just like the AI, we're determined to fill in that gap. And Jordy is somebody I would affectionately call somebody that's launched a, a thousand conspiracies. And I've probably been at the heart of, of some of them as well. But he's here, he's here with us. And, Jordy, I was saying to you during the break, you know, A, people will probably be questioning whether you are the real Jordy Rose. B, there'll be people playing backward, reverse speech, stuff like that. And then you started threatening to go into reverse speech yourself. Too. <laughs> I would if I could, but I don't, I don't think I have that capability. Well, you know, I got really worried today when I went on to Skype to find you because there was like two or three Geordie Roses and one obviously is a spoof account of yours. I hope it's a spoof account because it was called the Machine Overlord. So, you know, I yeah. was thinking to myself, who am I speaking to here tonight? But Geordie, all joking aside, man, thanks for being here. And before the break, we were touching upon when you had said that the D-Wave literally bring, brings back resources from these other dimensions now, that led to me and others out there saying, well, what effect does that have on that dimension, if it's exactly the same as this, apart from the state of a qubit? And what effect does it have on our reality as well? You yourself had a laugh about the whole quantum key to the abyss and the Mandela effect, but that's why these kind of conversations struck up in the first place, because we didn't quite know what you were meaning when you said that, and that's why it's great to have you here today to fill in those gaps. I'm uh, doing. I'm gonna do my best. Do your best. So, so are, we're not literally like a tearing another world apart when we're firing up the machine and bringing back resources. I mean, what do you mean by bringing back resources from other dimensions? Well, I think dimension is the wrong word, uh, uh, and if I use that, I, I uh, I'm gonna have to apologize because I don't think you, you did. Know, I think you called it a parallel reality. In all fairness. Yeah, yeah. So in in uh, this this idea that's been that, that's at some 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 ways at the heart of quantum mechanics, but also it's been popularized in everything from TV shows to movies, like sliders, for example. Uh, that might be that might be I might be dating myself there with that <laughs> reference, but the the idea that um, the decisions that you make create different paths through time. So if you decided to uh, let's say you if you're if you're married if you'd never met your your spouse, then you would have continued to exist and gone through your life and uh the there would have been a you that that experienced a completely different trajectory through through the universe so in quantum mechanics those differences are not just um fantasies they're real in the same way that our experiences are real and the those different trajectories you can call them um different universes if you want to use that tech terminology although it's kind of a little bit weird because the universe is supposed to have everything in it but they're basically just different paths through through things and uh in a quantum computer the the you're you're manip you're manipulating these paths in order for all of them to 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 agree on something which is the answer to your question so there's no sense in which anything is being destroyed if you if you if you're okay with this way of thinking about quantum mechanics, the way you would think about it is that all of these different parallel realities are exactly the same from your perspective and they all compute the same answer. 
So you can think of it as the, you, well, these different trajectories usually move apart and never talk to each other, so you never meet the you that didn't meet your spouse. In a quantum computer, what happens is even though they're, they're not the same, they've moved away a little bit, the states of their qubits are different, they actually come back and touch. And when they touch, uh, they kind of become one, they fuse, they go the other way. And this fusion process allows you to extract the answer to a question that you ask. So uh, this sounds very weird. And I, I have to say that probably most people who have uh, you know, PhDs in condensed matter theory would kind of roll their eyes if they heard this description. And I admit that's true. But part of the issue is that we don't have an agreement about what quantum mechanics actually means. Are there actually different parallel realities? Nobody knows. Lots of people think that they're just mathematical illusions and that we use them to compute answers, but they're not real. And then some people believe, no, they're really there. And this difference is um, a big flaw in physics. So physics is filled with holes. And often people will claim that, oh, you know, we know a lot about the way the world works. But, and that's true. But there are lots of things about basic things that we don't understand. And one of them is, what does quantum mechanics describe? Is it really a bunch of parallel slider style universes? Or is that all kind of just wishful human-like thinking? And what it really is is just a bunch of equations that math that we, we compute with. And it's not just this. Nobody knows what time is. So this is a related issue. It might not sound like it, but time itself is not well understood. What is it? Nobody really knows. Uh, the two biggest theories of our time, general relativity and quantum mechanics, are completely incompatible ways of looking at the world. They're not just that they don't work well together. It's that they describe nature in a fundamentally different way. Um, so uh, all of these things are, make it kind of an exciting thing to try to be a theoretical physicist nowadays. But unfortunately, I don't know why, but the, the physics has gone in the other direction of not thinking about big ideas and instead doing all this incremental, the, the poetry and the soul is gone from the study of this stuff. I think, on my soapbox here, if more theoretical physicists were to think more like artists about the aesthetic of a thing, like for example, is it possible to to either prove or disprove the existence of this multiverse picture. Now, some people do think about these sorts of things, but they're in the dramatic minority. Most newly minted PhDs in physics go on to do other things that are much more pedestrian. And I think there's a, re there's a reason for that. And, you know, it's not like I'm, I want to say you can't do that, but I do wish that there were more, um, there were more thinkers like Seth Lloyd, which is, theoretical physicist nowadays. He thinks about all sorts of different kinds of interesting things. Um, and there aren't. And I don't know why. I think part of it is that, you know, people are a little bit embarrassed or they don't like to think about things with this aesthetic view. Like, what is quantum mechanics describing? Uh, that's an important question. And you don't get at that question by saying, oh, it's a bunch of amplitudes that interfere with each other. That's not right. Like, it's technically correct, but it, it basically is, is yoinks the soul right out of the thing, leaves you with this gray, shapeless mass that who the hell in their right mind would want to spend their life thinking about a bunch of amplitudes that are interfering with each other. No, no, absolutely, man. I'm sitting here smiling because I'm thinking to myself, if you had said that during that Idea City talk, then probably, you know, YouTube would have had thousands of hours less of content to worry about. But no, finally, before we move on, the altar to the alien god. I mean, you was that just a, a kind of to drum up the crowd, you know, get them interested in it? Or, like some have said, are you literally a communications device to <coughs> an alien god? So, uh, most, most people, at least that I know of, have been inside uh, a church of some denomination, uh, sometimes regularly. And even the most uh, agnostic or atheistic of all of them can't help but to feel something. And what that thing is uh, doesn't have to be divine. In fact, I don't think that it is. I, I, well, I try to 
to keep an open mind about things that for me usually the most obvious answer is is likely to be correct so for me i think that there's something you know there's something transcendent about the religious experience that humans have that does not mean that i think that there are divine entities behind it i think it's solely created by our own selves but it's real so when you build a cathedral and you go in there with a bunch of people who are all kind of like you and you're all sharing the same experience there's something about that that is a hint or a whisper of something that transcends our normal experience so the d-wave machine for me and again maybe i should apologize for being uh you know having this more poetic view of the world has that same feeling to it maybe it's because i was instrumental in building it and i feel some i don't know attachment because i was involved in it and i know how it works in a very detailed way i was i actually built some of the things in there or at least was involved in it and it 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 has this feeling that what you're looking at is not like anything else that's ever been built no matter you know what you think about the technology it's certainly true that it's unique it's just nothing else has ever been built that is even remotely like it and um for me that triggers that same whisper of religious awe now do i actually think that there are alien gods no i don't believe in the like i said i don't the supernatural doesn't play an active role in my life like i don't feel like it's necessary i respect people who have these beliefs um because i understand how powerful this the drives are to believe and to to be part of something but i'm not one of those people so that that statement i stand by it it is like that it's like being in a cathedral it feels transcendent at least to me now i think that if you were to take somebody else and bring them in front of it they would say okay so if any if any of you in the in the, uh, the that are listening to this have ever been to uh a clinic with an mri machine you you'll hear that like one hertz like one per second pulse in the background it looks like so that thing is called a pulse tube dilution or pulse tube refrigerator it's it's a it's basically a pump that um makes things colder using just drawing on a vacuum so it basically pulls all the hot molecules out hot atoms out and cools down the thing that's associated with so the d wave machine has one of these that drives one of those cooling stages so when you listen to it it sounds like a 1 hertz pulse now there are lots of other things that have 1 hertz pulses like the heartbeat once per second is about the same you know as a as a heartbeat it's a total coincidence but you can't help but feel like when you're standing next to this thing my god that sounds like a heartbeat <laughs> now is it no it's a pulse tube um pulling on a vacuum just like you'd have in any other cryogenic setup uh but given the context and the fact that it's this giant black box and it's got this quantum stuff going on inside of it and it's unique it has this feeling yeah so the, the yes, big... it does feel like the altar to an alien god but no, no there are no actual alien gods but, but that's brilliant jordy <laughs> that's brilliant you see that that's that's when i reached out to you that this is exactly what we both agreed would be good you know coming on and, and given the kind of back story filling in some of the gaps and and that's great to hear you saying that and i definitely get where you're coming from especially as somebody who's brought this quantum computer into the world it's your creation i mean it's literally like a child i mean you you developed this you created it out of nothing it was nothing before and then it was something so i get why why you're so passionate about it and why you might feel that so we're going to move on now you know to more of your current work and of course you're working with the quite brilliant dr suzanne gildert olivia Norton and Holly Peck as well. Now, together along with the team at Sanctuary AI, you're literally trying to bring the TV show Westworld to life. And yes, I'm stealing that quote from Suzanne. So talk to us about what that's like and where the current state of artificial intelligence is because this is the one topic I think that raises the most fear in people as we move forward into these more technological times. 
Yeah, so the, the Westworld thing, uh, definitely not the rapey and murdery parts of Westworld. <laughs> the technology, maybe. Uh, the, the, uh, the actual uses to which the technology were put um, are, a, are a, a description of what not to do with technology like this. But um, in terms of the technology itself, the, it can, you can't help when you're doing something like this to be inspired by the idea of building machines that are like people. Now, the, the example that I usually use is data from Star Trek, because I think data from Star Trek is a lot more of an aspirational character in that he's flawed, he's not perfect, he's not superhuman, uh, and he works together with people in a way that makes people better. So the, um, the, the science fiction future that I would point to is more like the Star Trek future. Westworld is uh, uh, kind of an unfortunate choice because it's a dystopia where, um, you know, mo but most science fiction when it comes to AI paints dystopian pictures because conflict drives story, right? If there's no conflict, then there's, there's no story. But the kinds of science fiction that I prefer are ones where the humans and their AI companions are on one side of the conflict and something else is on the other side of the conflict. And, and Star Trek does this quite well. Uh, so on the other side of the conflict can be other AIs like the Borg. So uh, I think that, the, uh, that, that that's a, a better way of thinking about it. But yeah, so we've, we've uh, um, um, through this strange journey that I've taken in my technological life, come to what I consider to be the holy grail of, uh, of at least human level uh, technology, which is to try to, to figure out how the human mind works well enough to build machines that are indistinguishable from human. And part of the thesis that we're working on is that the physical body of a, of a robot or a, or a creature, you know, something like a, you know, a biological organism is fundamentally connected to the way it thinks about the world. So an octopus uh, that lives under the water and has eight arms and tentacles is never going to think about the world the same way a human is. It's going to develop understandings of its environment that we can't and vice versa. And this idea is sometimes called embodied cognition. Uh, we take it very literally to the extent that the robots that we build, we try to make them as human-like as possible. Because we believe that you can't actually build human-like intelligence outside of a human-like body. We don't think it's actually possible. Now, this is a, um, uh, again, like much of the things that I've done in my career, it's not completely, it's not a popular opinion in AI. Uh, most people in AI either believe, A, we shouldn't be trying to build human-like intelligence at all. Why would you do that? Or B, if we were going to do it, we should do it via the simulated route. So basically build everything inside of a computer and this real world is somehow on a side. I don't believe that, uh, I don't believe that's ever going to work. If you, if you build AI inside a computer, inside a simulated world, you will get something and it may become exceedingly good at some things, but it'll never be like a person. In order to be like a person, you have to be able to feel the texture of a rose. If you can't do that, we can't have a conversation about what a rose is. So the, in order to feel what a rose feels like, you need fingers, you need sensors in your fingers, you need eyes to be able to look where you're going, you need pain in your fingers to know if you've pricked a finger on a thorn. So all of these things come with the, the physical package that we are. So we're trying to build an integrated system, not just the mind, but also the body that the mind is designed to control. And of course, we ourselves, I've often kind of said this on the show, that when you break down the human body, uh, I mean, we're just a biological computer ourselves. It's quite easy to do, you know, eyes, webcams. They take in data and our brains, the CPU, it processes it. In fact, it renders all of the graphics as well. And of course, this is the kind of field that you're looking at in, in artificial intelligence right now, right? A, how our brain works and how similar with machine learning, how, it, how you break down the images of reality, these patterns that are all around us. This is really what's bringing about these rapid advancements, right? But I would say that the, the, this thing that we're trying to do, and more broadly speaking, the idea that you can take a, a person's mind and build a engineered version of it, nobody knows if you can do that yet. And there, 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 are, um, there are lots of people whose initial reaction, even highly technical people, 
that there's something special about maybe not just human minds, but the minds of any animal. Uh, so dualists would call this a soul. Uh, there's something that's not material that is important. And again, I don't want to discount that as a possibility. The way you find this out is at some point in your trying to build these machines, you fail, and then you've pinpointed where that thing is. So if it turns out that there is some reason why we can't build the minds of, of, of you know, whatever it can be, from everything from, say, an ant to a human, um, if there's some reason we can't, I want to know why. Because if, if, if we could find this negative result, that there's a specific reason why we can't build machines that are like us, that would be one of the most um, satisfying discoveries of all time. Because as, in terms of like the way that modern science views the world, which I agree is not necessarily correct, modern science, there is no difference between a human and a, call, call it a meat robot, an automaton that follows some rules, um, that, you know, the rules of physics and, uh, our perception of free will and the choice and the morality of our decisions and all this are just illusions. So this is, this is what science indicates. Now I would be perfectly happy. Uh, and in fact, I think I would be overjoyed to discover through science and engineering that that was wrong. And part of the reason science is so powerful is that it can be wrong, and the quest to discover the fact that it's wrong is the whole point. So uh, often uh, it could it could appear that somebody like you know the the thing that we're doing here, which has its an objective to build machines that you can't tell from people. One of the uh, reactions you might have is, well, how arrogant are you to think that you can build machines like a person? And I have to say to everybody, I don't think we necessarily can, but. It's still worth trying to do, even if all you want to discover is where this breaks. So I think that it, the, the strongest evidence that you could have that you can't just build a machine like a person is the efforts to do so fail in a way that's understood. And then you've pinpointed exactly where this thing is. And then you can say, you can, you can throw up your hands and say, this is an insolvable problem. We can't get around this. There's something fundamental that's limiting us from doing this. Or you can say, let's try to find a way to do this anyway. We're going to need to invent some new science, or we're going to need to understand who we are in a very different way. And maybe even we'd have to introduce something like the dual dualist picture of the world back into science, where it isn't now, uh, in order to overcome this thing that we've discovered using science. So um, uh, uh, I'm perfectly happy with the notion that uh, what we're trying to do can't work, but I'm not willing to give up until we determine that for sure. And right now what I've found is that much of this project is actually very straightforward. So being a building robots that are like people isn't drop dead simple, but it's within this, the powers of modern science. So we can build a machine like a person physically that looks like a person, moves like a person, has the same power densities and all of that. We can do that. The problem that we're facing now is can we make it like a person in the way that it is? Can it ex have a subject subjective view of the world that matches ours? Can it have qualia, you know, these things like what does a rose petal feel like that match ours? How would we know? So these sorts of things now become the real hard problems. And within this project, first you start with the easy things. You build a body, you build a robot, you, you, you do the easy things on the perception side, like you give it webcams and microphones and touch sensors and all that. Uh, and then you start on the real hard stuff. And where we're at, where, just to answer one of your early questions about where we're at, right now, it's, uh, if, if you were to say the body is a, is a journey from, say, like 1 to, say, 100, where 100 is just like a person, we're probably around uh, 10. The, on the mind side, if 1 is um, uh, doesn't move at all and 100 is just like a person, I'd say we're around a 5. So both of these things are right in the early stages, although the body thing is much easier um, than the mind thing. So the progress on the body side is going to be steeper than the mind side.
Now, Jordi, I hope I can keep you for a little bit of time after the break because we've still got like simulation to quickly get into as well. Yeah, I could do that. Oh, that that's <laughs> awesome. I'm shameless, man. That the listeners they know what I'm like. I'm I'm utterly shameless. But I hope you're enjoying the show so far, and I hope we're really filling in some of those gaps I keep talking about for the listeners out there playing on the screen right now. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, you'll see some of the stuff that Sanctuary are working on. That was a film by Holly Peck right there. And it's literally, it's absolutely amazing to see some of that technology, Jordi. I was saying to you before the show to watch the scientists there wearing the almost exoskeletons and teaching the robots how to move. But we can get into more of this in the next part. And we're also going to get into the fact that you're the one man I've come across that claims he could build a soul. Now, this, <laughs> this, of course, this, of course, sparks a lot more conspiracy theories out there, so we'll get into this after the break. I've heard your kind of um, logic behind building the soul. I'm really keen for you to share it with the audience. And, of course, for these robots to be truly human-like, you know, they're going to have to be self-aware. They're going to have to be conscious. What is consciousness? You know, in the first place. So we'll get into all of these things after the break with Jordy Rose. And Jordy, where can people follow your work and follow the work of Sanctuary? Well, I've sort of stepped back from the public sphere a little bit. I don't do a lot of uh, external facing stuff anymore. I'm too busy trying to be confused all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 I'm at on Twitter at Real, uh, Real Jordy Rose. We'll get it on the other side, folks. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going into overtime with our very special guest today, the quite brilliant, the genius that is Jordi Rose, the guy who brought us the D-Wave computer, along with the team at D-Wave Systems, and he's currently working at Sanctuary AI, building robots that will be indistinguishable from humans. Now, during one of the segments of the show, I was talking about the fact that our brains are very much like a quantum computer. And when you think about reality, about life, you know, very much of what we see and what we know and what we believe literally only exists within our brains. It's constructs that we build for ourselves. And this is something I heard today's guest talking about when I was doing the deep dive in preparation for today's show. And like I said before the break, Jordy is the one person I've heard claiming, and I don't know, you know, maybe there's others out there, but he says that he can build a soul. Now, Jordy, this is the segment that will probably launch another bajillion conspiracies, but talk to us about this, man. Building a soul, how do you do that? Okay, so before I get this, this I think we should talk about the simulation hypothesis, because they're related. So uh, broad, the simulation hypothesis is a... Is a uh, is an, the idea that this everything that we see around us and our our perception of the world and, and the world itself is a uh, is a is a computer simulation, and we're characters in something like a, a video game. And uh, to to kind of ground this in reality, in if you've ever played any video game at all that has kind of like a three dimensional aspect to it, where there are characters running around in it. Often you'll have the, the characters that are controlled by players to, with a joystick or whatever, and then you'll have the NPCs that are running around controlled by, quote-unquote, AI, although it's not really AI, but some, some way that they behave. So the simulation hypothesis I has the idea in it that as technology proceeds, things like video games become more immersive. We're going to want to be actually in the video game, so instead of, like, watching my guy on the screen and controlling with a controller instead I'll have like a virtual reality headset and I'll feel like I'm actually inside the world and if you've ever played with a, an Oculus Rift or a, an HTC Vive you've seen examples of this already where you're immersed in a three-dimensional world you can move around it and do things now of course that technology is very primitive but now imagine 40 years ago the state of the art in computer games was like a screen this big where there was like a single dot moving around is Pong, something like Pong. And that we went from Pong to World of Warcraft. Imagine the same level of increase 30, 40, 50 years in the future 
it doesn't take a lot of imagination to feel like maybe we can create immersive worlds where we can't actually tell which world we're in. So when I put on the headset, I know that the thing I'm looking at isn't quote unquote real because I can feel the headset on my face. But maybe some future technology, they'll be like lasers pointed at my eyes and it'll be like beamed right into my head or something like that. And I won't be able to tell whether what I'm looking at is quote unquote real, the thing that surrounds us now, or the simulation. So the simulation hypothesis states that it's overwhelmingly likely, for a variety of reasons that I won't get into, that we're actually in a simulation now. So uh, the reason I preface this soul thing by that is that... Um, You ask, like, what is a soul? So you, you might be able to list a set of prescriptions about how people view this, this thing. Like, what is it? Where does it come from? Um, what properties does it have? How would I feel, say, after I die? All this sort of thing. So if you went out and made a list of all of this stuff, and by the way, if you don't accept that you could actually list all these things, that's fine. It's a perfectly good perspective. But just do your best. So the thing about human ingenuity is that we can often create things as long as we can specify them well enough. So if you believe that we at some point could create something so real that we could fool ourselves into believing that everything we've ever experienced is actually real when it's not, then all of the properties that you can think of as a soul, you could be built into that kind of a thing. If all of this is a simulation, why couldn't I simulate any kind of perspective of heaven or hell or the afterlife or whatever the, your, your faith believes, why couldn't I just create a computer version of this that is exactly the same as what you think it should be? If you could do that, then the, uh, you know, the subjective passage of time in that could be slowed a lot. So, you know, the, for example, in stories like Altered Carbon, the idea that you can you know, store somebody for like a, you know, a short period of time, but it feels like eternity. It was actually a Black Mirror episode, I think, about this also. I think it was Black Mirror. Uh, and, um, you know, make a second stretch out into like, you know, a billion years, or at least from the subjective experience of the observer. So it's not, I think maybe the more accurate statement is not that I could do it, the more accurate statement is I think that all of the properties that are ascribed to this uh, this thing, we might be able to build technology that mimics all of them, including, you know, the, the afterlife and all of this sort of thing. If you could find a way to uh, immerse somebody in a reality of your own creation or of somebody's own creation that was indistinguishable from, you know, what we perceive now. So that's what I meant by that. No, absolutely. And, you know, the more that we can replicate things that we see here in the air quotes natural world around us, because I'm like you, I think there's a lot of aspects of reality that really tie in with this simulation theory. And like I was saying to you during the break, perhaps, you know, we're restricted by our language and the fact that, you know, go back a couple of hundred years ago, Jordi, and people, you, you say quantum computer, people would have, you know, no idea what you're talking about. And perhaps we just don't have an understanding of how everything works, what's going on here. But the closest thing to it, that, that pattern recognition, it takes us to the simulation. And I've had people saying to me before, you know, what, what if we're inside a D wave? And then if we're inside a D wave, what, what if that D wave's inside another D wave? And it opens up that whole Russian doll scenario, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, the if I was still a theoretical physicist, I think that the the thing that I would be most interested in studying is, is um, whether or not you can make the simulation hypothesis idea um, a proper theory of nature. So um, the, the, right now it's kind of like a slapped on after effect that comes from, it comes from an observation of the world that we build technology that's increasingly like this. So why wouldn't we just keep doing that and eventually it would become like this? Whereas I think that um, a different angle of attack on this whole simulation thing is, is there a way that we could figure out whether it's true by using scientific methods? And uh, this is a really interesting thing. And the analogy would be, let's say that uh, we'd created a video game like World of Warcraft, but you know, World of Warcraft version 87 or something that's in 50 years. Could the creatures, the NPCs inside the game 
devise a way to figure out that they were in a game. And, and, and when we start thinking about this, it's really kind of tough to figure out how they would do that. Uh, but, again, humans are ingenious. Uh, we, as long as we apply ourselves to asking the right kinds of questions, we often get answers. So I think that the, the, at least one path for, for theoretical physics is to question not just the things like, is quantum mechanics the right description of matter? which is one level a good question but on the other level maybe question something even more fundamental than that is that what is the nature of the thing that is these raw laws are supposed to be describing because maybe they're describing the simulation parameters in a computer like maybe quantum mechanics is quantum like it comes in discrete chunks because we're running on a digital computer that has a fixed bit depth you know computers have you know the way we build them now have like say 64 bits that describe something that's a finite number. Maybe quantum mechanics is somehow related to the finite bit depth of the computers that are running the simulation. You see, that's why I say that. You, <laughs> I, see, that's why I say that your machine that you fire up. You see, that's that's the thing that's causing this pesky Mandela effect. You see, you're glitching the matrix, Jordy. So I don't. Uh, so the thing, the thing about that that's kind of weird is um, this thing I was saying before about people don't really understand what time is. So we, we definitely feel like the past is different from the future in one key respect, and that we believe the past is fixed and the future is not. But most, if not all, um, you know, of the laws of physics are a time reversal symmetric, which means there is no difference between the past and the future from the perspective of the laws themselves. Now, there are things that, are, that do break that symmetry, like um, statistics, like thermodynamics uh, gives you an arrow of time that goes in one direction. But the underlying laws like quantum mechanics and general relativity don't have that property. So that opens up the question about whether the past really is fixed and it, to the extent that that is meaningful. Because there are lots of events in the past that we don't have any record of and maybe even in principle you couldn't recollect. Like for example, there was probably a person who lived in the year 731 in Mesopotamia or that area that was having breakfast on the morning of May 14th and they definitely did eat something, but there is no way even in principle now to know what that was. All the evidence of that has been erased from the physical record. Um, there, you could never know, even in principle. So does that mean it actually happened or not? And that is uh, not just a uh, philosophical question, it's also a physics question about whether or not you can recover information from the past, even in principle. And if you can't, does that mean that it didn't actually happen? Um, so the, 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 this Mandela effect, well, I think in some level it's, at some level it's, it's, it's obvious what's happening. It's just people misremembering. Um, there is a, a, a thing that isn't as clear, which is that, uh, certain pieces of information about the past are no longer accessible to us at all, but we know that they, they happened. So what about them? You know, what's that all about? And that is connected to quantum mechanics and physics more generally because it has to do with the properties of information. You know, is, is, uh, is the information about what that person ate in that morning, uh, is it actually recoverable in principle or not? Uh, and I actually don't know. I think the answer is no because of statistical reasons. It just vanishes into the 10 to the 50 atoms that make up our solar system or however many. You know, but, since, we're going uh, since we're going quantum, Jordy, you know, I suppose it would depend if anyone was there to observe it or not, right? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm there, there is no, that you, but but it's it's important to know that that observer thing isn't about humans. It's about any physical system. Is that any any anything that interacts with a system is considered to have been observing it. So it's kind of a, a poor choice of words. Is usually we ascribe observer to like a, a like a human. But that's not the case. Observer in quantum mechanics just means any physical system that interacts with the thing that is quote unquote observed. So we've got about 15 or so minutes left and I just want to backtrack quickly to the soul because this will be a controversial thing that people will talk about. And you know, here we are, humans ourselves, I mean, how do we even prove something like the soul? Now I know they say that they can weigh you after death and there's a discrepancy in the way things like that. But the reason I say that is you know, when it comes to the question of does sanctuary robots, do they possess a soul? Uh, and how would we ever know anyway? Because the AI, the robots, they're going to tell us that they do. They might believe they have. Well, the same as we believe we have. So how do we really tell anyway, Jordy? 
So my, my, my perspective on this is that the, the thing that usually people think of as the soul doesn't exist in the sense that it's not an actual physical thing that exists in the world, okay? But we, to the extent that we can figure out what we mean by that word, it's like we should have a shared understanding of what it is as humans. So one of the wonderful things that humans do, which is different than any other animal that we know of anyway, is that we can, we can come up with abstract thoughts and share them with language. So something like a soul is an abstract thought that is connected to a whole bunch of other abstract thoughts. And when I say that word, it means different things to different people. But if we can agree on what we mean by it, even if just, ex so if you believe in the, in the physical reality of the soul, that's fine. We don't know, but you might be right. But let's say you aren't. In, in that case, if we can still agree on what it is, human ingenuity can create machines that give that thing in all of its breadth and depth. So the, the thing that I really believe fundamentally is that any thought that we have, we can make real using science and technology. So if we, uh, if we can agree on what a thing is, even if it's not quote unquote real, we can create a world that has it. So we did this with cars. Cars weren't real 200 years ago. Now they are. Computers, they weren't real 200 years ago. Now they are. You can go down like hundreds and hundreds of things that have become real because we had an idea in our head about a thing that didn't exist. And then using the resources of science and engineering, we built the thing in our head. Why couldn't we do that with other things? In fact, I think that as long as you can make it quite clear what you mean by anything at all. If you claim we can't build it, there should be a reason. And the, the reason that we can't do it now is not a good reason. Because with everything we've ever built, you, you know, we couldn't build cars in the 1700s for a bunch of reasons, but eventually we did. So if you wanted to, to if, if, the, if you're a religious person who fervently wants everything that you believe to be quote unquote true, and maybe you somehow doubt it, even in the, the dark hours of the night. Human ingenuity can construct the thing that you're thinking of eventually. So whether we do or not is a matter of our decisions as, as a civilization. Do we want to build X or do we want to build Y? And in the case of AI, this is a, this is a raging controversy about what AI should be, where its boundaries should lie, if any, what do we want it to look like? Do we want AI to be always our servant? Or do we want to be, create AI that's so powerful that it takes over from us in certain things and maybe everything? And it's not a simple matter to try to draw lines here. We often give away power to others that are more capable than we are. When I go to the doctor to see about my knee cartilage, the reason I'm not doing it myself is that the doctor is better at that than I am, and I'm okay with that. So we, we do this all the time in our lives. And so with AI, we have to figure out where is the line? Is there anything that we don't want AI to be able to take care of for us? And um, it gets a very complicated thing. And it's related to these questions of uh, what are we as humans? What makes us special, if anything? Um, what is it about ourselves that we would want to, uh, to keep unique, if anything? And, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is um, it's a little bit, it's beyond the state of the art in the field of AI now, because most people who are, if anybody's watching this, who's like an AI practitioner, you're probably rolling your eyes, thinking, oh my God, we're so far from having to deal with any of that stuff. And I agree, it's a long way away, but it's a long way away on maybe our time scales, because, you know, we only live a few de decades. But a few decades is a blink of the eye in terms of you know the lifespan of a, of a of a of a of a species or you know a civilization and what looks like a long time to us you know 20 30 years is 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 just a is is a tick of a clock in terms of the the progress of you know the the evolution of our intelligence from you know the 
billions of years ago to now. So these things are things we should be thinking about, even if they're even if they're not uh, front of mind. And of course, a lot of people, myself included, we've pointed to the fact that as with any new emerging technology, you've got DARPA very interested in all of this. And I think that's where a lot of the worry comes from as well. You know, that whole Terminator scenario, the weaponization of AI. And I know that's something that you're quite outspoken about as well, Jordy, right? Yeah. So the, the, I have chosen um, as a matter of, you know, my own, call it ethical stance, I suppose, to not have anything to do with the weaponization of AI. And, and, and uh, this is a little bit more subtle than me just standing up and saying, you know, we should never do this. Because there are situations where it is the right thing to do to defend yourself. If there are legitimately bad people who are infringing upon your rights and liberties, you have the right to defend yourself using any tool at your disposal, as far as I'm concerned. And that includes weaponizing AI. So you don't have to look too back, back too far in the future to see uh, where anybody in their right mind would agree. It's this the Britain being attacked by the Nazis in World War II. If they had the ability to defend themselves better using a, a super weapon, is it ethical to do that given the atrocious nature of that regime? The answer is yes. The United States had to make that ethical decision with the uh, nuclear using uh, atomic weapons in, on Japan at the end of World War II. So these things are complicated, and I don't want to make light of a very complicated s situation. It's not always true that the simplest, best-sounding solution is the one that you should follow. But I have limited hours in the day, and the things that I want to work on, I want them to be obviously good for the flourishing of humans. And building weapons is not in that category for me. I know somebody has to do it, and I know that I will benefit from their work if it ever comes to that. Um, and I salute them, and I thank them. But I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to do other things. And uh, I think that, that you know, the, my, my basic philosophy when it comes to all this stuff is, is one of personal responsibility. Every single person has to make a decision about how they're going to act and the consequences of that is on you. It's not on some, you know, mommy state, I'm going to call the police about something or other. It's you. You deal with the positives, you deal with the negatives. And for me, personally, I've decided that I don't want to work on building military technology. And, uh, but others that do, you know, I, I don't have a problem with them. Uh, because I know that this is not as simple as just you know, let's not do this thing. Uh, it's much, the world is much more complicated than that. Now, of course, one of the ways to avoid this, and uh, your good friend, Elon Musk, you know, he's been outspoken about this. He says one of the ways to uh, avoid this nightmare scenario with AI would be to merge with the actual machine itself. And, of course, he's got a dog in this fight because he's got a company called Neuralink with a neural lace coming to us. But what does Jordy Rose say? Do you see a future where we become part of the same hive mind that the synths may be plugged into? Or do you see us living happily ever after? How do you see this going, Jordy? So I, I'm fundamentally a very conservative person. And um, I, I think that the, there's something about this idea of merging with machines that strikes me as being not what I want myself. You know, if I had the opportunity to... Um, to plug in directly to the internet so I didn't have to use a phone or a computer, uh, I probably wouldn't do it. But uh, generations change, you know. So my, my kids are no, no they're, they're almost nothing like me when it comes to dealing with technology. They grew up with the internet and the prevalence of phones and social media and all this. But we didn't have a computer in my house when I was a kid. There was no internet hadn't even been invented yet. I mean, the, 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 the difference between now and when I was young is so vast that I have trouble projecting my own fears, I suppose, onto the future. So for me, um, the idea of merging with machines feels like something I wouldn't want to have happen to me personally. Now, wh whether or not it's necessary or a good idea for others in the future that's their decision. It goes back to this personal responsibility thing. 
if somebody makes the decision that they want to do something, I don't want anybody to have anything to say about that except the person. If somebody says, I want to participate in this, awesome. If they say, I don't want to participate in this, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So the, I think that what will happen in the future is there will be increasingly options for people to do increasingly mergey kinds of things with machines. And you can already see this. VR is more mergey than you know, a TRS-80 was. Uh, there are going to be things that make VR look like child's play when you can start plugging directly into computer systems, direct brain interfaces and things like this. And uh, being an, an old guy who grew up before computers, that's very hard for me to think about doing. And I would say no myself. But again, I, I think it's brilliant to understand things. I like having options. So if we had a world where you could do this or not, I think that's a better world than you can't do it at all because science is advanced, technology is advanced, choices have increased. But for me personally, I'm like, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably go the other way as I get older and start drawing backwards more and more from using technology because I feel like uh, a lot of the... A lot of the mental health issues that are so rampant nowadays and the lack of understanding that people have about how the real world operates, which you see in uh, a bunch of different avenues on, you know, the social media and, and uh, this regressive left movement, these, the people who have these ideas are so disconnected from reality that you have to ask why, what is the mechanism, how did that happen? And I think the reason is they don't experience People don't experience reality as much as they used to. And again, I don't want to sound like an old guy complaining, like, get off my lawn. But when I was a kid, I spent all my time digging in the dirt. You know, I had dirt under my fingernails, like literally digging in the dirt. So you get some appreciation for like how things work when you're like banging things with sticks. And if you're never exposed to the way the actual world works, Instead, what you're exposed to is this weird illusion that is the internet. And you start developing all sorts of weird ideas that have nothing to do with reality. Uh, and I, I feel like everybody's susceptible to this. Like, I find myself being drawn into these social uh, media things. And I have to, like, pull back and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to have anything to do with this. This is not real. What's real is the things that I can see, the people I'm interacting with. My responsibility is to deal with that, not well, all of us. Well, well, Jordy, I'm going to have to steal you for a couple of minutes on the other side just to wrap this up. But folks, Jordy Rose will be right back. One of the technological geniuses of our time, Jordy Rose, right here for all of you today on the Kev Baker Show. Jordy, can't thank you enough for your time, sir. We've got a couple other things to get into. But, you know, we were talking during one of the previous breaks about how we need to get you over to Scotland, man. You, you would rock a kilt for sure, dude. <laughs> well, uh, at some point I thought that I was of Scottish ancestry, but it turns out it's not true. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> you know, Alistair Crowley's old house is up for sale, so we could start the rumour that you're looking at that. <laughs> That would be perfect, right? So you know they're going to play that bit backwards as well. But no, again, all joking aside, thanks for hanging out with me today. You've certainly given me a couple of things to think about. I'll need to go back and listen to this show a good couple of times before it's all going to sink in. And again, thank you for bringing this technology to the world. You know, whatever way people view it, good or bad, you've certainly changed the game. And not many people can really come along and say that. Now, before the break, we were touching on social media. I've got a 17-year-old, you've got children as well. And the impact that that's having long-term, who only knows? And I think you worry about this as well, Jordy, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I view social media as being the primary um, near-term... Well, there's two, there's two things that AI is now doing that I think are, are potentially think, things we have to think about very carefully. So one is the... Um, uh, when you join a social network, you provide a lot of data about yourself to the network. And the more data that is available to the company that you're providing it to, the better that they get at predicting the sorts of things that you'd want to buy, the kind of person that you are, who you'll vote for, etc. cetera. And uh, that's not all bad, but people need to, to realize that 
your value to the network is more about selling your information to people who can use it to an end that you might not want. So in the case of an election committee, I can, if I'm one of these giant social networks, know pretty clearly who you're going to vote for. And even if I don't know that, I might be able to know what to, to tell you in order to sway your opinion in a particular way. That is exceptionally dangerous to the, to the whole idea of Western democracy. So that's one thing. The other thing I, that you have to watch out for in AI, of course, is automation. Because people are, uh, uh, people are going to be competing with machines for jobs in the near future. And autonomous driving is the, short, the, the sharp end of the wedge there, where a lot of people make a living driving. And that could all go away in the not too distant future. But the social media thing is a lot more insidious because you don't see it. If somebody loses a job to a, an autonomous truck, you see it. There's, there's Joe, your neighbor, and he's no longer working because this truck is driving around. If somebody is trying to influence you to vote a certain way, you don't see it because it's hidden behind all of this kind of I illusion world that is the social media networks. And you may be manipulated and you don't even know it. So I think that is a much bigger problem for the long-term health of society. If Western democracies can't function, then that is a much bigger problem than job loss. Uh, and that's you know the, the, the big issue I have with... Uh, Social media isn't so much the social media; it's the it's the uses to which it's being put on a regular basis, without informing the people that are using it that this is the way that it's being used. Yeah, and it's the most interconnected we've ever been as a species. Yet you look around you, and people are so disconnected; it's unreal. It's kind of strange times. Everyone's got their face in these devices, like some kind of scrying device or something like that. So yeah, it's definitely. Well, they've moved, they've moved away from being object. You've most people, at least in where I live, have moved away from being people who live in what you could call the real world into people that have this one foot in each side of the door existence where one foot is in the real world. You know, you can still step out in front of a car and get hit. But the other foot is in this world of illusion and fakery, which isn't real at all, which is the world that is projected through their phone. And I wish more people would stop and think, none of this is real. The stuff coming out of this phone has no connection whatsoever to what's going on around me. It's not even the same universe. Stop paying so much attention to it. It's not real. It's just a bunch of people trying to make you do shit. They're trying to make you buy things and trying to make you vote in certain ways and all of this. Uh, and it's not to your benefit. They don't care about you. What they care about is what you I mean, can bring to the people who are paying them. Would you say the internet? Uh, and I just of, would you wish say, that this was better understood? Yeah. Would you say the internet of things then very much along the same lines? Because really, most of the gadgets, the air quotes, smart gadgets, smart fridges, smart toilet roll holders, it's ridiculous, right? But they're all gathering data, aren't they? That's what it's all about. In the end of the day, I wouldn't lump everything into the same category because certain of these things are. The, the, thing, the thing about it that, that bugs me is not being transparent to the person about how the data is being used and not burying it in a bunch of like size three font that's like 400 pages long. The, the, there, there is a, a, a moral and ethical duty that companies have to tell you what they're doing with your data. They have to do that and they don't and it drives me nuts. So in the case of like a... Um, a smart thermostat. There's nothing inherently good or bad about a smart thermostat. If the company that's selling it to you says it will adjust itself based on your use of electricity and all of that data just stays in your house, fine. That's great. I mean, it makes you, you spend less money on electricity. That's great. But on the other hand, if what they're doing is using all that data because um, they want to know, for example, something about you that's going to be used for you know, determining how much your house is worth and then sell all that data to a real estate company or something like that. That is not okay unless you say to this person, this is what I'm doing. Are you okay with it? And they really understand it. So, um, yeah, so the, the social media stuff is, I think, in a different category than the Internet of Things thing because there it's very clear that nobody understands what's going on. It may be that they don't care, although I find that hard to believe. Um, people should care more. You know, it's not free. These, these services that you're using, even though you're not actually paying them dollars, you're generating an enormous amount of profit 
for the people who are hosting your data. And the reason that they're making profit is because of your data. It's because of you. They're making money from you. Uh, so it's not free. And and data is uh, king in this world now. I mean, look at how the data has been used in somewhere like China, Jordy. You know, you've got the social credit scoring system and everything you do online basically, you know, dictates what you can do in life. And what do you think about, you know, moving forward into the future? Do you think we'll see more governance by algorithm, for lack of a better term? Maybe, but I think the uh, the the thing that I'd like to understand is is whether or not technological solutions are better and in what ways, because it's not always the case that they're better. If somebody comes up with something that says, okay, um, the taxes that I pay are going to be come up with by like uh, an AI, and I believe the AI is fair and all that, okay, why not? I mean, maybe it can make a better decision about how much tax I should pay than the people who are currently in charge. Um, on the other hand, if the you know somebody comes up with a system that says, you know, I'm going to create an AI and set your taxes, and then it sets them, and they're like seven thousand <laughs> percent. Like, no, this was better than before. This is worse. So I think that uh, you know I'm I'm o I'm okay and open to any basic like anything that gives you an option on trying to get something better. But we have to be clear that sometimes things aren't better. Just because it's more advanced or it has more features or uh, it's like version three instead of two, that doesn't make it better. Uh, and the uh, the social media is not better than real friends. It's not. So in this case, the technology that was introduced hijacked a bunch of processes in our brain that were subjective, were 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 were, were vulnerable to. We have vulnerabilities. We want to belong to a group. We want to be liked. We want to have friends. We want people to care about what we do. These platforms hijacked all of that, provided an illusion that satisfies the surface desires that we have, but decays and rots the underlying principles upon which those are built. So uh, I don't think that things like social media are a progress. I think that they're terrible. They can be weaponized in a variety of ways, and they have been. And they are uh, ruining discourse. Um, they're creating pockets of the ridiculousness where you can find sort of 10 people that can be, believe any ridiculous thing. And then all of a sudden it's a real thing because, you know, there's a group of people saying it. It's like Whereas a, it's, in the real world, you yes. know, it would never, stupid ideas don't survive that way because they're stupid. Stupid ideas thrive on the internet because there's nobody to directly challenge them and there's no metric for gauging them. Whereas in the real world, there is a metric. You know, s stupid ideas don't survive very long when they're trying to be implemented in, in practice. And of course, social media, you know, you could probably think of that as a weapon of mass distraction. But, you know, I have to thank you again for your time today. And I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions before we go, you know, clear up a couple of the things that listeners might have wanted asked. You know, we might sure. have a laugh along the way as well, Jordy, because some of the, the crazier stuff might come out. And I say crazy, some of the stuff I've said, okay. But what about the claims that you may have received the information to build the D-Wave from nefarious sources, i.e. dark, demonic, HP Lovecraftian, old one entities? Well, uh, I can say that my my own subjective experience is I received most of the original ideas from MIT physicists uh, Ed Farhi and Seth Lloyd. See, not <laughs> not, not quite as exciting as probably people were wanting there. And, and you well, know, no, I think I think those guys are pretty interesting folks. Uh, Ed Ed is a, is, a, is an interesting cat, so is Seth. So they're not exactly risen to the level or sunk to the level of demonic entities. Yet. Uh, and of course, uh, Suzanne, but they're pretty cool. Your colleague Suzanne, the brilliant Suzanne Gilder, she says that you know working at Sanctuary is a bit more like black magic than science at this point. Would you say it's almost going from the realms of science into magic with what you're doing, Jordy? Uh, so again, the with apologies to my poetic bent, there's this <laughs> old idea in magic of, of imagining something and then making it happen. So creating something from nothing. And uh, the, the, one of the things you usually need there is a model. You know, like you have to have an idea about what the thing that you want to have happen. And so we do think about describing the things that we want to build as carefully as we can before we build them. Uh, 
the there is another sense in which what we do is kind of verging on thinking like that, where uh, we pay an awful a lot of attention to the aesthetics of the things that we build, how they look, how they feel, the emotions that they engender when you're in contact with them. So these are very difficult things to characterize as a scientist. Like, what does it mean to to feel religious awe or to um, to feel uh, like a transcendent experience. Like we don't have a meter that you can hold up to you and measure how transcendent you're feeling. So, uh, the, you know, in some ways what we do, we attempt to merge the worlds of, um, you know, aesthetic consideration, which is basically the art instinct in humans, things that are beautiful and symmetric and appealing and have that touch of the transcendence. We try to bring that together with the realities that all of that is kind of, just bullshit unless you can make it real in the world. So we need to have the scientific uh, grounding as well. So yeah, I mean, sure, I'll say there is some magic, but the magic is a is a very concrete tor- sort. Okay, so we've got the synths as well, and a lot of claims have been made about just what kind of intelligence will be powering them. You know, is it going to be a narrow kind of specific AI just in that individual robot? Is it going to be coming from some hive mind back at the sanctuary itself? Or, as some claims have been made, are they almost going to be like the golems of old times where they'll be indwelt by these, the tsunami that, that's going to be upon us soon? So the way that the, the synths work technically is that certain aspects of their control is, is local to the synth. So there are little computers on the synth that do things like reflexes. So if a, a synth is, is hurting itself, you know, it's touching something hot or something, there needs to be a very fast feedback loop that takes the data from the sensor, no, I'm, I'm overheating, that's not good, and does an action, which is, say, pull away from it. So these low-level instinctive behaviors are all, like, packed into the computing systems that are on the body of the synth itself. But most of the control is actually coming from the, a remote controller, so you can imagine that there's some kind of a, 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 a mind somewhere that's sending signals over wireless to the robot, and those signals are then turned into actuations, so they actually move. And the, 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 the mind that's controlling the robots usually now is, is another person, which we call a pilot, which you can think of as a, a, a remote controller of the robot, uh, a person who sees what the robot sees, hears what the robot hears, feels what the robot feels. And then when they move, the, the robot moves analogously to them. So if I go like this, the robot goes like that. Um, over time, the uh, idea is to replace the human pilot for initially what you could think of as narrow capabilities. Like, for example, let's say that in the course of doing what it's doing, the, the, the AI, the, the synth has to play chess. So playing chess is a thing that computers do quite well, you might say to the person, okay, go and have a coffee and come back in 15 minutes after this game is done. And in the intervening time, this narrow AI is going to have gone play chess against a person in the real world. So these ideas that you weave together, different kinds of control are integral to the way that we build these things. And in practice, the way that we do things is we, we put as many different kinds of controllers as we can into the software system that do a whole bunch of different kinds of things. And then there's a kind of a meta controller that sits over them and decides which one is appropriate in this particular moment. So if the synth is doing task X, there are certain kinds of controllers that are good for that. If it's doing task Y, there's others. Uh, but mostly when you're doing anything that you consider to be difficult nowadays, none of those narrow AI things are good enough. You need an actual human in the loop. So over the next couple of years, at least, every time you see a th- synth, nearly all of it is going to be human in the loop control. There's a person puppeting the synth body. You can think of it as just like a marionette, an advanced marionette. So you've never gone to work in the morning, the lab at Sanctuary, opened the door and they've all been playing a giant game of Risk or anything like that? Nothing like that to worry about yet? No. <coughs> no. But I have to say that uh, it is very easy to, uh, to look at a synth and think they're a person. Um, and especially if somebody has moved them around. So they, they have places where they usually are in the office. 
uh, because of a variety of things, like there's certain kinds of testing or experiments we're doing. And if somebody moves them around, it can be quite disconcerting. So I remember it was one time when one of the synths was moved to like our receptionist area and was sat behind the receptionist table so that when you open the door to come in the office, the first thing you saw was the synth. And the first time I saw that, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a, uh, like I had a visceral reaction. Um, but I'm, we're so used to it now that it's kind of, no. But the, no, I mean, they, they do do cer certain autonomous things, but they're really simple and uh, obviously not very smart. Uh, just deterministic if then rule kinds of things like if a person walks into the in, into my field of vision and I know who the person is then say hi to them that kind of stuff but you know that's so far from from intelligence that it, it's a totally different kind of thing but, but you're trying dude you're trying to bring it into reality and this is what you strive to do when it comes to these things and then um, yeah just listening to you there man it's um, strange times that we're living in for sure Jordy and you've seen not just your own AI that's there at Sanctuary, but I know you're excited about some of the work that Google are doing, stuff like that. We hear about DeepMind as well out there. Mm -hmm. And if we go full circle back to where we began in that lecture, that presentation you gave at Idea City, towards the end you were giving out predictions. Now, one of them was about exoplanets, and I think yeah. you've pretty much ticked the box there. And another one you made was by the year 2028, we will have made machines that can think like us. Now, it was Turin back in the 50s. He started talking about machines that can think like us. And that yeah. was six years ago now that you made that claim, that it would be 2028. Do you want to revise your timeline at all now that you're seeing no, things advancing? I think, I, think, I, think, I think it's about right. Yeah. Well, any last thoughts, Jordy, before I let you go? Because I'll, I'll give you the floor. Since, like I said at the start as well, I've had so much air time out of you. It's fair that I give you the final word, sir. Well, I'd like to thank, thank you very much for, for having me on. Um, I, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I want to say uh, a, a thanks to all of your listeners uh, for, for listening. And... Um, Hopefully that, you know, I've, I've, I've put forward the way that I think about things in a clear enough way to kind of interpret some of the crazy shit that I say sometimes. Keep saying it, Jordy. Keep saying it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, think, I think another thing I would say is, like, I'm on your side. So I'm a real humanist. Uh, I don't like technology just for technology's sake. The reason is why I've done the things that I've done have been at least attempting to make things better for people. Um, I don't know if they've always succeeded because this stuff is, is, ends up being, just because of the way business works, these things are always bought by large corporations and governments, at least at the beginning, and the benefits don't roll down to normal people, at least right away. Maybe they will someday, I hope so. Uh, but at least uh, I think that... that uh, my heart's in the right place, and so is the, the folks who work here. Is that we're, we're really trying to understand how we work with the intent of building things that make people's lives better. We want to take away the drudgery of the everyday work and have human civilization understand itself better. And again, my view is very simple, is that if you want to understand something, you have to build it. And that's the, at the heart of what we're trying to do. Absolutely brilliant, man. We've just got a couple of minutes left. So, you know, we've both got young children and the world we're moving into, you know, people talk a lot about AI and robots taking our jobs. But for young people out there, Jordy, I mean, wouldn't you encourage them more so than ever now to get into robotics, AI, stuff like that? I found it's very difficult to convince your children to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it, dude. I, Tell me about I, it. Yeah, I keep I keep trying to get my kids interested in like combative sports, like wrestle. Like I used to wrestle a lot and did Brazilian jiu-jitsu and stuff. And I always had this fantasy that all my kids would become, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu or wrestling Olympic gold medalists. And uh, doesn't look like it's going to happen. So I don't know. I don't have any advice. I don't think I'm a very good parent. <laughs> but uh, um, I think that the if if I was to give advice to the parents, I think that the uh, try to keep your kids away from screens as long as you can. Uh, technology is not good for kids, and and, and you're going to hear a lot of other stuff about all oh, need to be included, and you need to learn about the way the world works. But and then maybe it's again just the get off my lawn thing. But 
I have this deep suspicion that the all of what we are as people, the hardwiring that's in us, the way we are as humans, all of it developed when there wasn't technology around. And nat our natural state doesn't involve technology. And so if you if you introduce something as powerful and as pointed as modern technology, the the young human brain has no defenses against it. And I think it actually changes the way kids' brains work, and not for the better. So I uh, I think that if I was to give any advice to to parents of young children, keep them away from technology as long as you can. I know you can't do it forever. Uh, and when they do start using technology, set rules about how long they can use it for and what they can use it, and then stick to them no matter what, uh, and, tr and try to limit the uh, use as much as possible. In terms of schooling and stuff, um, I don't know. I mean... I, I do uh, so modern humanities at universities is a total train wreck. Yeah, the the university humanities has been hijacked by people who are completely, like I was saying before, disconnected from reality. I don't know where these people came from. Uh, I hope they don't succeed in what they're trying to do. Uh, but I really have a deep respect for the actual humanities, which is you know the study of literature, history, um, understanding where we came from. Um, art and art appreciation, uh, music. So even though I think that, yes, people should be good at math and yes, people should understand what science is and yes, maybe you should go into engineering, I wouldn't do it at the ex at the expense of what you used to be called a liberal arts education. Now I don't even know what it is, but you know, the, the, the real stuff, the, um, you know, making sure that you've read at least a few of the the books that kind of underpin modern civilization and understand something about the history of religion and all of that sort of thing. Um, so you know, a little bit of everything, an open mind, be skeptical of everything. Don't believe anything you read on the internet. And that would basically be my, <laughs> my wisdom to pass down to the next generation. Right, that's brilliant, man. And you see, you're not the scary warlock that I used to think you were. You're, 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 you're just normal. You're down to earth. And of course, people will still think you're a sense, Geordie. You know that. Yeah, well, I guess uh, it's it is it is a, uh, uh, something I hope someday to uh, aspire to become synthetic, <laughs> or at least a copy of it, but uh, not yet. No, this, this has been brilliant, really, really brilliant, dude, and it's been fantastic. It's been an honor to have you on the show here to share some of your information, talk about some of your inventions, talk about some of your thoughts on the world that we're moving into, Jordy. It's been absolutely brilliant, and I wish you and the team over at Sanctuary all the best. And if you ever talk to Elon, tell him he needs to get on the show, right? All right, I'll see what I can do. Absolutely fantastic. So, ladies and gentlemen, just like I promised, we would get the very best people to come on and talk about the topics that we're left to speculate at times. Now, I know that probably won't satisfy everyone out there, but we can't get much better than going to the horse's mouth, so to speak. So a big, huge thank you to Jordy, the team at D-Wave, everyone at Sanctuary. By this time next week, you know, people will be saying, I'm shilling for D-Wave, shilling for the synths. You know how things go in this crazy alternative media world that we move in. But I'm glad that you all tuned in today. And coming up after today's show, we have got Lucky. She'll be taking on the baton. The information just continues to flow right here on Truth Frequency Radio, www.tfr live tomorrow two hours with Jordy Rose. Can you believe it, folks? I'm away to pinch myself just to make sure it was real. I'm going to listen to this all over again. And I thank you all for tuning in. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Yeah,